we're very happy to have Dr. Craig Miller here. I'm going to introduce uh, Jay Aff, who's going to introduce Craig, uh, who's a member of his board. Uh, Jay is a professor in um, Tepper as well as in engineering and public policy, uh, and he's head of the Carnegie Mellon Energy, no, Electric Industry Center, who's known as C. Oh, that's pretty close. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks, David. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the smartest guy in the electric power industry. Without any question, uh, Craig has made advances that other people only dream about. He is the chief scientist of uh, one of the most progressive organizations in the electric power industry, the National Rural Electric Co-op uh, Administration. Uh, Close. Association. <laughs> and um, he, uh, he has founded seven startups. Seven, yes. Um, and. Every time I listen to him, I learn something. So I'm sure oh, I'm going God. to do so today. Craig, thank you so much for coming to see him. Ted, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. I feel great. I got the applause early, so I don't have to worry too much now. Life is good. Um, and I hate it when people write big checks, but Jay wrote one, so I'll try to cash it. I'm going to talk about the future of the grid. And I'm going to start in 1969, even though the grid had been around for a while at that point. Um, I was born in 1950. And uh, 1959, the Russians launched Sputnik, and it, it was a tremendous event. You know, people were terrified that American technology was going backwards, and every smart kid was pushed into science, and, and space was magic. I lived through space. I stayed up uh, to listen to all the launches on the radio, and then when we got a television, uh, you know, I, I would come up at all hours to watch Walter Cronkite out there in, at Cape Canaveral, as it was then. And in 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. And it was the th most thrilling moment of my life. I mean, I was overjoyed. I can remember exactly where I was. And I came bouncing back to the place where my family were staying during the summer. And my dad said, boy, you're really happy. And I said, yeah, dad, they landed on the moon. You know, how good is that? And he said, well, do you think NASA's successful? And I said, yeah, they landed a man on the moon. And he said, no, they aren't, because they have no idea what they're going to do next. And my dad was right, because after we had a few lunar missions, NASA kind of lost their way. I think they've got some cool stuff going on now, and I have some friends there. But my dad then sat back and he said, any plan that ends short of global conquest hasn't been thought through to conclusion. <laughs> it's an aphorism, and obviously he meant it symbolically, but um, metaphorically. But in truth, every time you plan something, you should look forward. You should say, where is it going to go? So that after you take a step forward, where do you go next? And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the future of the grid. Trying to imagine a totally different grid. The people I work with and the people I work for run utilities on a day-to-day -day basis. They are faced by difficult but bounded engineering problems. How to extend this feeder, how to, how to meet a reactive power requirement, how to build a power plant once in a while if you're lucky, you get to do that. But they're bounded engineering problems. And working on those day-to-day, -day, we don't always understand the context of what we're doing. The electrical grid in the United States started in 1893, and it went for about a century getting better and better and better, but pretty much being built on the same principles, which I'm going to talk about. Since then, we have undertaken an effort to reinvent the electrical grid of the United States. It is the most interesting engineering project that anybody anywhere could have. But we lose sight of that titanic project, that titanic challenge in our day-to-day -day work. So every once in a while, it's good to step back and remember that we're doing something really cool. OK, do we need a new grid? And the answer is hell no. The electrical grid of the United States is a tremendous piece of engineering. Uh, it, was, it was recognized in 2000 by the National Academy of Engineering as the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. Um, Secretary Moniz, the Secretary of Energy, said at an IEEE conference about two years ago, the electrical grid of the United States is a continent-spanning machine of immense complexity that is at its best when it's invisible. 
How perfect a sentence is that? That's why I had to remember it. I had to memorize it. Continent spanning machine. Just think of a chance to build something that big. Okay? So we don't need one. It actually works pretty well. Okay? It's not the best. It's about the 30th best electrical grid in the world uh, among nations on, in terms of reliability. But we have a difficult situation. We have a very vast country with a lot of rural areas, and we don't have a central control authority who, who, who designs or conceives or even regulates it in any great sense. So we're doing pretty good. Um, but that's not the way engineers do things. We don't need a new grid. But what engineer has ever said that's good enough? Okay? I mean, you wouldn't be here, any of you, if you didn't have the mindset that you want to do something better. You look at things and you say, I can do better than that. I can improve that. From the very first engineers and utility have asked, how can we do it better? Every component, every procedure, every organization in the electrical grid has been buffed and polished and refined and reconceived. The stuff that we look at now, that, that we use now, is amazing. But you know what? The engineers aren't done. That's the first transformer ever deployed. You can go see it in um, a museum in Manhattan. Um, it was 1883 at the Pearl Street Station. Um, it was built by Edison, uh, even though he wasn't a big fan of, of alternating current. Um, a General Electric transformer is on the right, a descendant of Edison's company. Um, they're basically the same. They're both yokes of iron with some copper windings. The one on the right has a whole bunch of things sticking out of the top, load tap changers, things to measure the temperature and the pressure, and uh, to even analyze the chemistry of the oil in it. But it's the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's an iron yoke transformer. This thing down here is a solid state transformer. It makes a nice sinusoidal waveform by switching on and off really fast. So fast that you can't tell that it's really just a bunch of zeros and ones. It looks very close to a sine wave, okay? That's a 3,000 amp solid state transformer, which is an amazing achievement. It's at North Carolina State University. And uh, the wonderful student who built it is, is proud as heck. I asked him once, I said, that's really cool, but how are you going to get that up a pole? And he didn't know I was joking, and he spent the next half hour telling me about making it rugged and miniature. So <laughs> I let him go on. Okay, the grid evolves in little steps. Okay, the grid is so complex that you can't design it. You have to design pieces of it. Our mind can't get around the totality, so we change things every day. We improve something. One of my favorite quotes, Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist. He said that the mother of every chicken is a chicken, and the daughter of every chicken is a chicken. But in 10,000 generations, great-grandmother and great-granddaughter wouldn't recognize each other. Okay, And that's true of the grid. The grid tomorrow is going to look indistinguishable from the grid we have today. But the grid 10 years from now is going to look a lot different. The grid 50 years from now will be unrecognizable. Okay. Will the future grid be smart? Yeah. That's Hoover Dam. I love Hoover Dam. Anybody who gets a chance to visit Hoover Dam, take that tour. It's really impressive. Um, one of the most extraordinary pieces of engineering ever. We aren't building those anymore. Um, the original electrical grid used angular momentum. We had enormous generators that spun and had a lot of angular momentum. So the power they made was immense. It was perfect. It was 60.000 hertz. Or at least that generator's opinion of 60 hertz. And who's going to disagree with Hoover Dam? Hoover Dam's pretty damn big. So the grid itself was made stable because it was big. It had mass, literally mass. And it was expensive. Uh, long distance transmission lines like those on the right on a very, very hot day in Kansas, you can tell from the extent to which the cables are sagging, are very expensive, they're difficult to build, and they're not entirely necessary. So the grid of the future is not going to be based on mass, it's going to be based on something else. So let's think about materials. Henry Petrosky is one of the greatest engineering theorists, philosophers, historians. 
And he observed that an invention of a new material is the most fundamental thing in engineering. When you get a new material, it allows you to look at every problem you've ever solved and say, could I do it differently? Could I do it better? You know, Teflon, Kevlar, you know, and aramid fibers in general. Bridges, I love bridges. You know, what engineer doesn't love bridges? And the first one was probably this log thrown down across a creek. And an engineer came along and he said, let's make it flat on top. And hey, let's put on a ring. And boy, that was state of the art, I'll tell you, man. People stopped falling in the creek. But then somebody came along with stone and they started to build these, these large arch bridges. And then the Romans with concrete and bigger, bigger bridges, some fantastic aqueducts. And then iron, and I saw so many iron bridges actually in this part of Pennsylvania. They're quite extraordinary. You can go out in the countryside and see beautiful iron truss bridges. I hope somebody preserves them. And then steel, and now finally we're building our bridges out of aramid fibers. That's, uh, Kevlar is an aramid fiber. Uh, so is the, the material that holds your tires together. But it turns out it's a fantastic material for building bridges because it is very strong. And if you can put it in tension, you are not going to break it. That bridge on the right is made out of aramid. And I think it's one of the most beautiful structures ever made. So what's our new material? There it is, silicon. That's Shockley, Bardeen, and Bertain at Bell Labs. A um, long time ago, and they invented the first transistor, and, and there's a few people in the room who recognize that as a transistor. Um, <laughs> you know, that's the way they looked in, in my youth. Um, the one on the right has 731 million transistors, uh, the Core i7, pretty impressive. The part at the bottom is a phasor measurement unit. Basically, the new material that is allowing us to reinvent the grid, to create the smart grid, is silicon. Because we've managed to, we, we've created a capability to understand what the grid is doing and to react actively to that, to treat it as something we can control. Hoover Dam didn't need to be controlled. It forced everything in its wake to comply with its version of 60 hertz. Okay? And its load was, I mean, its power was so titanic that a small generator was immediately brought into phase. A small load, she didn't notice it. Okay? But the grid of the future is going to have lots of little components operating in a relentless, never ending dance. And it's silicon that makes that possible. It allows us to measure what's going on to make decisions at lightning speed, and then to adjust in all sorts of ways, in thousands of points on every feeder. That's the future grid. It's a silicon grid. Where are we? We're right in the middle. Between 1883 and 1990, the grid was entirely an aspect of angular momentum. And by the way, the angular momentum in the United States electrical grid would keep the lights on for somewhere between 8 and 12 seconds if we stopped burning fuel. That's the entire angular momentum of the grid, but that's fantastic. That's going to shrink down to somewhere around two or three seconds as we use more generation technology, such as solar, which doesn't have an angular uh, momentum component. From 2025 on, and I hope it's that soon, it's going to be analytically driven, dynamically managed. We are in the transition time, the interesting time. There's no better time to live because we're the ones who get to figure out how to make that bridge. And bridges are what engineers do. The smart grid is not a technology. People say smart meters and people say conservation voltage reduction or something. Not many people say that. But people are all about smart meters and they're all about DG. But in fact, the smart grid is dozens of different technologies, more every year. It's about them together, dancing together in a way to reimagine a grid that is constantly monitored, actively controlled, responding to changing requirements on a constant basis. Okay, here's how it works. These are two feeders, one red and one blue, and they connect up at the top with that little green open circle. Open circle on an electrical diagram means a switch that isn't closed. So we have the red feeder and the blue feeder and the sun is shining and oh, it's a great day, okay? Except something bad happens and that blue feeder gets broken. That little tornado knocks over a tree, severs a line and all of the people up there in green um, no longer have power. By the way, electric, electrical 
grid operators are upside down. We think red is good and green is bad, okay? Uh, literally, <laughs> okay? So that green area, those are people who have no power. So what do you do? Well, you send out Dave the lineman. In all of the smart grid, we must not get away from the fact that this is a physical world out there, that there are poles, there are conductors, there are towers, there are huge transformers, and we need people who are smart enough to actually put them in place and not blow up the equipment or electrocute themselves. Okay? Dave the lineman is in no fear of being obsoleted or offshored. These are studly guys. My son's a lineman, by the way. Um, and I'm proud as hell of that. So what do you do beyond Dave? You close the switch. That little switch up there closes. And now power goes up. The red substation goes through what's known as a um, recloser and comes down on the blue substation side. Now how fast can you make that decision? We've built systems in Georgia that can make that decision in less than 10 seconds. So your power will go off. 10 seconds later, your power's on. That's pretty cool, okay? But what if things go wrong? What if you can't, what if all the extra load over there on the blue feeder is more than the red substation can handle? What do you do? I pose that question and I've, well, excuse me, I'm sorry. I posed that question and I talked to more than 100 engineers so far and said, what would you do under those circumstances? And I keep writing down answers. I should have stopped at 30 because we haven't gotten any new ideas in a while. But what would you do? Just imagine, the load's too great on your system. What would you do? Think about it. You'd shut things off. You'd shut off the pool heaters. Nobody needs their pool heater during a power outage, okay? We'd cycle hot water heaters. We would perhaps make sure that our first responders, our hospitals, our police stations had power and suspend service to a house now and then. We'd make sure that the people on medical equipment don't lose their power. We'd prioritize loads. So we'd use sectionalizing switches and we'd use the disconnect capabilities on meters to keep things bearable during this period. We can also get exotic. We could start to draw from batteries. Uh, storage out there. We could uh, also do something called conservation voltage reduction and that means in order to meet the current requirement we could lower the voltage a little bit, okay? So that we could still serve every load, not quite as bright, but you know it's, it's okay. We can keep things going pretty well. All of that's possible only if we have the silicon-based system that tells us what's going on, and we have all the agile little controls that let us tune the way things are operating. Okay, that's doable now. We've implemented that at Snapping Shoals Electric Cooperative uh, just south of Georgia. The two substations talk to each other. No control center is involved. They don't go back to somebody in a big office and say, mother may I. They sit down and work it out between themselves. Okay? Completely distributed decision making, autonomous control. Okay? Distributed control. Okay, so how does it work if you build a whole grid this way? Okay, it's a nice day. The utility's running smoothly. Everything is hot. That's red. Hot is good. Okay? So we have it made out of hexagons because that's the easiest thing to draw. And this is a really shitty day. That is not photoshopped. Um, this is a tornado and a monster lightning strikes in the utility. And immediately things start going out. Trees are getting ripped up. Uh, circuits are being overloaded due to EMF and due to direct lightning strike. And the power starts to go out. So what do you do? Well, right now you send out Dave the lineman, unless you've got a very advanced grid. But if we have a lot of backup power, distributed generation, stored energy, we could conceivably start to restore power in some areas using agile control. Then we can start, if we have switching technology that's agile, we can start to let them network, join with each other. And the bigger a grid is, the better. Bigger is better, size does matter in the electrical grid. Because the more components we have, the essentially the more stable it is. So we can start to do this. And once we start to get bigger systems, we can then start to extend power to other areas. Essentially, this is called the self-healing grid, okay? Soon, everyone has power, okay? And then, 
we start merging the local control, the areas that are blue that are locally controlled, into back into total operation. So think of what we're shooting for here. The grid is shattered by some catastrophic event. Each little piece looks around and says, what do I got? I got a little bit of generation, I got some batteries, I got some loads I can shed. How can I operate? And it operates the best it can, keeping the most essential services available at the highest level. Then these areas start to talk to each other and say, hey, can we do better together? You have a little excess generation, I have load I can shed. If we collaborate, can we improve the quality of service? Essentially, everybody goes autonomous when things are bad, and then everybody starts to talk to each other and reassemble the grid. This is, without a doubt, 100% achievable with current technology. There is nothing about this that cannot be built. And we're doing a project with Carnegie Mellon right now that is proving those algorithms. Okay? I was reading the math this morning and the graduate student's doing pretty darn good. So I'm impressed. So how do we build it? The seven keys, distributed generation, advanced architecture, and I'm gonna riff on that a bit because it's my favorite, cybersecurity, big data, advanced analytics, advanced communications, and agile control. Substantial research is needed in each area. But I believe these are the seven foundations of achieving what we call the Agile Fractal Grid, which is this future. Okay, distributed generation. Oh, that's not impressive. Okay, that's a generator. Okay, that's a big uh, diesel generator. That's a small wind farm. Those are very cool. Those are six foot high or two meter high wind generators that can cover roofs. They're made in southern Indiana. They're, they're kind of cute. You can actually carry one home in your station wagon. I did that actually, which is fun. Um, that's a Stirling engine um, built in the United States. That's a Stirling engine that's exactly the size of a uh, dishwasher. It slides underneath your counter. It makes hot water and electricity. It can keep your house going indefinitely on natural gas. It's a Spanish product. I like it very much. It's not available at 12060 yet but we're working on it. That's the world's smallest hydroelectric generator. It fits in, in irrigation trenches on farms. Doesn't do much, but it does a little. Um, that is a device which is to balance a system. You get any sort of generation plugs into it. There's batteries in there, and there's a controller that says, should I buy power, should I sell power? Should I buy power to storm, ch charge my battery? Should I discharge my battery? It does arbitrage. It also has some very clever circuitry. 30% of the people who install battery storage in PV systems make a mistake. They oversize the cables or they don't do adequate safety. This one runs a uh, test off of using a small battery to make sure that everything's wired correctly before it actually energizes or connects to the grid. You cannot hurt yourself with this device. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of pleased that the patents are mine. But anyway, uh, that's uh, a fuel cell, the bloom box, the famous bloom box. And that's a PV park at uh, San Diego Gas and Electric. It's kind of fun. You can charge your EV there. And those are tracking PV panels that also provide shade. Okay, so the, the whole point of this, I don't know which technology to recommend, and I'm not sure for any one place, you know, they all, there is, any one is the best everywhere, but we're seeing a blossoming of ideas. People are exploring everything. I mean, is a, is a two meter high uh, Darius rotator the right solution? Probably not in very many places, maybe in none eventually, but we're trying it. Research provide, research follows a life cycle. There's an out scoping when everybody's got a new idea and we try all of new ideas. There's a blossoming of innovation. And most of those ideas really suck, okay? And they die and we narrow in on three or four that survive and are good ideas. But then after a while, circumstances change, materials change, new ideas arise and we see an explosion again of creativity. We are still in an outscoping phase. Every week, 
almost literally, not metronomically, some weeks we get two, some weeks we get none, somebody calls my office with an idea they want us to test. Okay? We also have a second law competition where everybody then proves that they violated the second law of thermodynamics and we create a very amusing book of really stupid ideas. The worst of which was the one that, that used a generator in a trailer you pulled behind your car, your electric vehicle. That one was, <laughs> that was, that was really good. <laughs> and it generated power from the rotation of the wheels. Um, this is fun. I, went, I was going to a rural electric co-op and the guy said, ha, you know, rural, PV is not really going to catch on in our area. And on the way down I took a picture of Farmer Brown there with the panels all over his roof in a rural area. Why does this work? Why are we doing this? We're doing this because it's possible, because there are ideas that work, there are technologies that make sense or are coming close to making sense. But the other reason is because do-it-yourself always wins. When cars were invented, we hired mechanics to drive the cars because driving was too complicated for mortals, okay? Writing a report, I mean, I, you people have never been cursed with the, 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 the process of, of writing a report in log hand and then hiring someone to type it. I mean, that, that's horrible, okay? But now everybody, of course, has got their own wonderful word processing machines. Booking a flight, nobody books a flight you know, through a travel agent anymore. Even writing, when writing was first invented by the Phoenicians, it was considered esoteric, the cutting edge of science. Oh my God, people are translating ideas into sounds and transcribing them on papyrus. How radical, how revolutionary is that? Preserving ideas instead of telling stories. The first literate pharaoh was Cleopatra. Before that, all of the reading and all of the writing was done by specialists who probably went to the equivalent of CMU in old Egypt, okay? But anyway, DIY always wins. I did a search for Off the Grid House on Bing and I got 150 million results. Um, that shows a couple of things, that people are really interested in Off the Grid Houses. The other thing is, if you'll notice, that has two significant digits which had me scratching my head. So I made a call to Microsoft and eventually got there. I found out that that's the biggest number that Bing will return. That's why it's 150 million. So Lord knows how many they are. But then I asked the guy at Bing, I said, does anybody ever page down to the 150 millionth least relevant reference? You know, I mean, who does that? Come on, guys. <laughs> um, that's a solar farm, uh, Department of Defense. That one's at, um, uh, Nellis Air Force Base in, in Las Vegas, it's the largest solar farm in the world. Um, DOD is going, do it yourself. And my favorite DIY, how to build a thousand dollar fusion reactor in your basement. Okay. <laughs> I can't wait, man. I mean, I just, you know, I, I got the thousand bucks, I just don't quite have the time. But, you know, I got to try this. I hope some of you do too, all right? So DIY always wins, okay? Anything and DIY energy is going to win. People are not going to just buy electricity when they have the ability to create it themselves. Okay, agile control. I showed you a simple example when we closed the switch and power flowed in unconventional ways. In fact, as we go forward in building the grid, we're creating lots more recloser switches. If you drive around Pittsburgh here, you will see recloser switches, and these are these are the ones in the upper left. These are radio controlled. They allow people to energize circuits or de-energize circuits. They are spreading all over the country. In the last six years on projects that I've done, we've deployed more than 100,000, okay, just among the rural electric co-ops. Uh, all the way on the right, called Varentech. This is from a Georgia Tech spinoff. Uh, this device essentially perfects the waveform and, and handles all of the reactive power. That thing in the middle is an antenna. It listens for arcs. The electrical grid is always arcing. Somewhere something is failing. Some wires are gapping or a transformer is misbehaving. This just listens for every arc. And if you put eight or 10 of these in your service territory and you use really good clocks, either single chip atomic clocks or, or some mathematics around GPS, you can triangulate where the arcs are and drive out and fix the grid before it fails. Fantastic technology, okay? 
That in the right is a phaser measurement unit. Uh, it's the size of a pair of glasses. The first PMU I ever saw was this big. They're now the size of a pair of glasses and you can sprinkle them all over the grid. They're gonna be very, very cheap soon. And at that point, we will know exactly what the waveform looks like and exactly what the phase looks like. And if we can do the arithmetic fast enough, we're gonna know what's going on in our grid at a level that is absolutely unprecedented. And we're going to imagine control strategies that preemptively moderate the, the, the transients in the grid that extend the lifetime of all of our equipment that allow us to respond instantly to things that are just starting to degrade before they fail. And that's my favorite. I love that's the solid state transformer again, except it's missing about 200 of its capacitors. Okay, advanced communications. The internet sucks. Um, the internet was built to provide speed and to serve a lot of people. Um, you see an ad on TV and they'll tell you Cox Communications gives you some sort of speed, you know, 50 megabit or whatever, and it covers every territory. Does anybody ever tell you what the latency is? Does anybody ever talk about security? Does everybody talk about reliability? Eh, it goes out now and then. If we're going to use it for industrial control, if we're going to use it to run the continent-spanning machine of immense complexity, we need to address these other attributes. We need security at an unprecedented level. If we're using the grid for control, the DDoS attack, like we saw last Friday, could be disastrous. Okay? We need latency. Yes, we're getting 50 megabit, but we may get it two minutes late, you know, or 30 seconds late. Okay, or five seconds late, and even five seconds in industrial control applications is, is disastrous, okay? Um, we need reliability at levels that are as good as the grid, not as, the good, as good as our internet browsing. So we're building next generation internet technology. Um, oh my goodness. Is this the only thing I had on that? Okay. We're building next generation internet technology, uh, you know, internet two with the appropriate speed, uh, the internet of things, which is actually kind of a, a problematic concept, the fact that everything should be communicating over the internet. You know, my toaster and my refrigerator, I don't think they have much in common. Um, and, and neither one, you know, you talk about Kant with either of them and they're just stupid. Uh, we don't need to automate everything to run the grid. It's not the Internet of Things. It's the industrial Internet. And while everybody's building IoT stuff, the big guys, AT&T, IBM, General Electric, have gotten together and formed the Industrial Internet Consortium, which is about the five attributes Internet. Okay, the conventional spread everywhere and give you speed, but also the reliability, the security, and the latency dead mortally reliable internet protocols. It's happening. Cybersecurity. Okay, five ways to make something secure. Sorry, I have to keep hitting my clock because I'm not supposed to go late. Um, if you're gonna, and I'm gonna stop crossing my arms, I promise, okay. Um, if you're gonna make something secure, there are five strategies. One is keep the bad guys out. Throw them in the who scale. Doesn't work. The FBI last year put exactly 55 people in jail for cyber crimes. Uh, in a survey by Gartner, less than 2% of self-identified hackers professed any fear of being caught. We're not putting enough people in jail to make a difference. We've heard that North Korea hacked Sony. Maybe Team Kumri doesn't agree, but nobody's going to the Who's for that, okay? We're not, that technique fails. The next technique is to build a firewall, a perimeter. But the era of firewalls is almost over. There are clever ways to get through most firewalls. Originally, we wrote down, this is, whatever, this is a list of every known virus. If anybody tries to put one of those in your system, we'll react. Of course, a zero-day exploit gets through that. Something, you write a new virus, it gets through. You write in what's called a polymorphic virus, which changes the way it looks all the time. It'll get through. Ah, but we're smart. So what we do is we create a sandbox, just a little virtual computer. We put the, the suspect software in it, and we watch it. And if it doesn't do anything bad for a minute, two minutes, five minutes, an hour, yeah, we'll let it through. Okay? Sandboxing. 
The problem is there are tools out there now that detect whether they're in a sandbox. Okay? And the, the most powerful of these is called Fertum Parent. It does 400 checks to see if it's in a sandbox. And if it fails any one of those, it sits quietly, perhaps for months. Okay? And bad news is the source code for Fertum Parent is available on the internet. So that anybody in this room, if you wanted to today, could start writing the most badass viruses ever conceived. No joke. Um, third method, reduce vulnerabilities. Hey, let's write code that doesn't have any vulnerabilities. Yeah, that's good. Okay. 100 utilities. How many had secure coding practices? Two. Okay? Two. Because it's hard. Okay? I mean, it's like getting up in the morning and resolving not to make a mistake. How does that work? Okay? Truth of the matter is, we have staggering numbers of vulnerabilities. The database which NIST maintains has 67,000 vulnerabilities. Okay? 67,000. So you write a piece of code and you say, okay, I'm going to get out that list of 67,000 and make sure none of those is in my code. No. No chance in hell. Very few people write really secure code. The way we secure code is we deploy shit and when it breaks, we fix it. Okay? That's the normal mode of operation. Segment the architecture. Okay, let's keep the control systems completely off the internet. Yes, we're on the internet so we could deal with our business side, give people bills and talk to our customers, but let's keep the control systems off the internet. That's failing. And the reason it's failing is that the internet provides useful information and services. Suppose I collect my metering data and I use that on the business side. I can map where an outage is by what meters I can't talk to or what meters have told me they're losing power. But I need to get that information from the business side over to the industrial side. Oops, there's a bridge there, okay? Um, I want to do some advanced analytics, so I want to share my information with somebody smarter than me sitting somewhere else. How am I going to talk to them? The internet. I was talking to one company who swore that their industrial control system, their SCADA system, was never on the internet. And I said, good for you. I'm really proud of that. Does it use software? Yeah. How do you update it? Well, I download. Okay. You know, seriously. And, and that was actually one of the largest power companies in the East. Downloads their software and, and for their SCADA. Of course they do. Okay? The barrier is becoming permeable between the business systems and our control systems. And the internet is just so damn useful that it's seductive. The biggest hack of electric utilities that, to date was conducted in Ukraine uh, starting in December of 2015. And there the system was very simple. There was a guy who had access on his desktop to the industrial control system. And he got an email. And by the way, he used the same computer for his email as the portal to the ICS. And it bridged. Okay? He got fished. He got a letter from the government. And he snapped to attention and read it. And uh, immediately upgraded his Excel to um, run the, the spreadsheet they'd send him for reporting. And in doing so, installed a macro that then danced across all of the systems there because he, he reached the ICS. And what it did is very interesting. And um, I'll tell you about it after I get this next one. The last strategy is reacting to the breach. Right. Our system's been hacked. We know it, right? Do you know if your systems have been hacked? Do you know? No, you don't. OK. On average, 204 days from when a system is breached until it's detected. OK? Six months, almost seven months. Because breach does not necessarily mean malicious action. In Ukraine, they breached the system, but they didn't know what to do. They're in, but they don't know where the SCADA is. They don't know how to control it. They don't know what the switches are that they can play with. They don't know the passwords to Oracle. They don't know where the encryption keys are. So they study, and they study, and they study. And nine months later in Ukraine, they turned off the power. 
nine months. So the fifth strategy, reacting to breach, offers a potential for immense improvement in the way we do cybersecurity. Imagine this. We are breached and we find it out in five seconds. Okay? Not 200 days, five seconds. Okay? Then we shut it off. We can shut the door or we can go back to partially manual operation. There is a potential here to obliterate the problem of cybersecurity. I mean, seriously, not just make incremental improvements, but make massive improvements in the security of our systems. If we can develop knowledge of the, our systems at a subtle level that allows us to detect an anomaly quickly, okay? And I've been working with CMU's machine learning people on that problem for a couple of years. And we have detected a breach and shut it down in four milliseconds. That's pretty damn good, okay? 200 days, four milliseconds. Yeah, we, uh, we did all right. Um, we're pretty proud of that. Um, your AI people here are unfreaking believable, all right? And you need artificial intelligence because the distribution grid is so complex that no human being can immediately recognize anything odd. But my grandpa, I've got to tell you my grandpa. My grandfather was a 19th century man. And uh, I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania, and we would go out and he would hunt a turkey for Thanksgiving. By the way, wild turkey really sucks. Butterball is much better. I didn't even know I liked turkey until I got a real butterball. But we would go out in the woods, and I was, you know, eight or ten, and this, this old man carrying a shotgun would wheel around, bang, the turkey was dead. I never saw the turkey. He had a 19th century mind that recognized the outline of a bush wasn't right or the color of this feather wasn't right. He developed completely unconsciously with rules he could never write down that there was something odd. What we need to develop for the grid is something like that. Something that can read every voltage, every switch setting. Every, you know, the state of every device on it, the traffic flow, who's talking to whom over the internet. Develop a vast, nuanced image of what the grid is. And as soon as something deviates, jump on it. This is absolutely possible. There is no fundamental barrier to doing this. It is difficult engineering, but it can be done. Okay, cybersecurity. Uh, yeah, that's the strike there. You breach then you explore and exploit, and then you monetize. Now it's 204 days, we wanna make it one day, one hour, 10 minutes. Okay, big data. We don't have big data. EPRI said that we're gonna have 10,000 times more data in the smart grid than in the electromechanical grid. Now let me give you a secret. This comes from 1967, 77, uh, sorry. I'm trying to remember when I did this. Every application in human history has this architecture. At the bottom, there's raw information. You organize the information and manage it in some way. Then you do the magic arithmetic. Then you make a decision, and then you implement the decision. And every program you have ever written has that structure. Okay? The, making the, the implementing the action may be what you read when you see a report. Okay? But that's every structure, uh, the structure of every program. Data, information, analysis, decision, action. This was adopted by IBM in 1977. They still build. We started out in our original architectures, pre-architectural I'll call it, when a computing environment had hundreds of programs, all of which had this structure, but they didn't talk to each other. Then. St. Ellison comes out of California, says let there be Oracle, and we started building databases to move things back and forth. And we tried to build integrated systems. Stage two, point-to-point -point connectivity. Then, oh no, let's put all of the data in one humongous database, okay? And that was the Oracle vision of the world. It failed catastrophically. I made a living for a while straightening out messes like this. Um, there are arcane reasons why this fails, but eventually that giant central database becomes so complex, so, voltage, so bloated, so impossible to maintain or even document, 
and so slow in its operation and moving the information back and forth that it fails. There can never be one central intelligence that knows everything, okay? The Wizard of Oz was actually a funny guy behind the curtain. He wasn't a real wizard, okay? But we've tried that. Then somebody came along and said, let's build an enterprise service bus. And this is where we have all those little applications. And every one of those applications is still the rainbow, data information, analysis, understanding, decision. But they all talk to each other through this wonderful gray bar that can move information between any pair. And this is a really clean architecture because we put that nice gray bar over all of the mess. You can't see the mess in there. Changing, vo changing units and voltages, I mean, changing units and connectivity and all of the routing and the back and the forth and conflicting. These architectures aren't better. They just hide the mess in one humongously complex and very difficult piece of architecture. This is where we need to do. We need to split our applications between the data layer and the analysis layer. Okay. If I look out there, I can find a utility pole somewhere. Now, hey, they undergrounded it all to make your campus pretty. But somewhere out there, there are electrical components, okay? And those electrical components are not quantum objects. They are there. They're not there or there. I mean, they have one location. They have one voltage. They have one current. They have one reality. The reality of the electrical grid at any point in time, or any segment of the grid, is a definite thing. Now suppose locally we could develop omniscience and understand that. What if we could do that, the bottom layer, collect the data and organize it, and make it available to everybody who needs to do anything with the grid? Right now in a SCADA system, say one from Schweitzer Electric, he, Ed Schweitzer's team collect all kinds of data, and then they do the arithmetic and they do something else. But what if they do things with it? But what if the guy also has components from OSI or Elster or, or any of these other companies? All of them collect the data they need, okay? Everybody's collecting all of the data in their own way, over and over and over. Needless duplication and inevitable conflict because nobody comes to agreement. Suppose we just could create this understanding, the grid state, an accurate, detailed, shareable picture of the state of the grid, and make that available to anyone, okay? 80% of the code in our SCADA systems goes away, because 80% of that code is right now getting the data right. And you know, you go to a place like CMU and, and great engineers and scientists, and you study the crap out of algorithms, so did I. And you become incredibly expert at doing the esoteric modeling and arithmetic. That's 5% of the problem. 80% of the problem is getting accurate state information. Then you do the really hard stuff for 5%, and then the rest is disseminating it and communicating it to people who need to make decisions. And this isn't some arbitrary, pull it out of my butt, 80-20 rule. This is counting lines of code actual counting lines of code in industrial control system software, okay? Not many people study getting the state right. That's a problem which is understudied and underappreciated, but which I believe is the most fundamental problem to unlocking the intellectual potential. So just imagine this. I write a system for a big utility, and it has the state data collect data, transform and organize, and I make it available to every device. All the devices are now operating off of the same view of the world. All of their operations are consistent. All of them are 50% cheaper because they don't have to write as much code. They are much less vulnerable to cyber attack because we've reduced our attack service. But now let's make it really cool. I take that feed out of my layer two there my transformation organization, and I give it to you guys. I've been in a lot of presentations with Jay, and he has students doing all kinds of analyses on IEEE taxonomic feeders, because that's what they have, or using limited data sets from PJM. If we implement something based on the estimation of the grid state, 
and we can share it. You can have real, live, or slightly delayed data to work with, the richest data sets. You can test everything you have against real world problems. I believe this is essential to making the leap to the agile fractal grid. I believe it is also essential to unlocking the intellectual potential of the people who are imagining the future grid. I think this is the single most important project that can be done. And the good news is the Department of Energy put a request for proposal on the street last week to do this, okay? Which is really great fun. Uh, I've only been nagging them for six years, okay? So, <laughs> so one of my other reasons to be in Pittsburgh is to stop crossing my arms, um, <laughs> is, 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 is to talk about this project going forward with, with people. But grid state estimation, grid state estimation. It's gonna happen. So I'm gonna wrap up because I want to ask, answer a few questions. I'm going to say two words, agile and fractal, okay? The future grid has to be agile because there's distributed generation, there are distributed controls, load is controllable. It has to be able to morph, to change, to adapt to changing circumstances, both within itself and in the environment that imposes constraints on it, whether they're weather constraints or, or the demand of the customers. The key to achieving agility is being fractal. And I, I, probably somebody here doesn't know exactly what fractal is. I mean, I know you've all heard the term, but let me, let me define fractal for you. A fractal principle is something which is the same across scale. Let's go back to you know, my grandpa, the hunter, used to put a cube of salt out, salt lick, and the deer would get custom, accustomed to coming over and licking this cube of salt. Um, and they would start to, and he would do this before the, the hunting season so that he knew where the deer was. He didn't like tramping around the woods. He preferred to just go out and shoot them. But um, he was a 19th century man, okay? Um, if I took that block of salt and I smashed it up into granules, I could sprinkle it on the sidewalk and it would melt the ice. But it's still salt. If you pick one of those rock salt up and taste it, it's still salt. If you put it under a microscope, it's still a body-centered cubic crystal, okay? If I grind up those stones until it's, it's a, you know, just a fine grained powder, I put it in a shaker, I shake it on my watermelon, it's great, but it's still salt. It tastes the same. Whether it's big or whether it's tiny, it's salt. But the grid isn't controlled that way. If we're controlling a house, think of the house as a grid, I have a home automation control system, okay? And it has very limited functionality. Then I'm managing my feeder and I have the intelligence in the substation and the control center. If I start to manage the transmission system, I have completely different rules of operation. Everybody solves just the problems that are appropriate to their scale. If we're going to create a truly agile grid in which the definition of what constitutes a grid is constantly changing, we have to abstract our concepts of control so that they are fluid, so that dishomogeneous things, the big chunk of the grid that's intact and the little chunk that's working on its own can have a meaningful dialogue. I believe that the future here is an agile grid and that a truly agile grid can only be achieved if we develop fractal concepts, okay? And I'm gonna show you just a few more slides, but I, yes? I'm sorry, we're out of time. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had until one. Please forgive me. Well, you know, it's okay, it's just, uh, I have like four minutes left, I can only get some questions. Please, okay, so, I'm sorry, I thought I had until okay. one. Um, so if I could just interrupt briefly and just, uh, for the room in general, if anybody did not, was not able to grab a lunch, please do so now. There's still some food outside. Um, and uh, then we'll have a, like just a few minutes for questions sure. because students have to run off of class. So of course. I'm sorry, I misunderstood yeah, the time. Yeah, no please excuse me. Um, anybody uh, have any questions? Yes, over here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, great talk. Uh, I just want to know so you talked about the industrial internet. So that would differ from the current internet. In, in, you mean by the 
protocols or the network layer, the physical layer, or, like, or what layer? Um, essentially, it's an isolated re-implementation. It, it maintains the OSI stack. Uh, but it has additional protocols built in for security and latency control, okay? And GE are the real leaders on that, okay? Yes, sir? I, how does the awareness of state of the grid differ from the big database concept of Oracle? Ah, because, first of all, it's not a huge amount of data. It's not. If you eliminate the redundant data, it's actually a small data problem. The second thing is that we're going to make most decisions locally, then communicate the local decision upwards saying, you cool with that? So it's kind of anomaly detection. It's going to, it's exactly. It's going, to be, it's going to be federated, agilely hierarchical decision making. There was a paper written on ultra-large systems by the Software Engineering Institute that was written for the Department of Defense on how to build systems of a scale. And unfortunately, um, the people who commissioned that didn't write systems of this scale, of the scale that we're envisioning. They, were, they wrote big, but they didn't write petascale. Um, and one of the principles of that strategy on, on very, very large-scale computing was, in fact, federated sacrificing perfection for agility, uh, constantly re rethinking your problems in an iterative way, not optimum, but continuously optimizing. You know, don't solve a, a million variable LP which is wrong, the, the, the values out of it are wrong by the time you finish the arithmetic, make a good decision and then continue to make it better and create a paradigm of continuous improvement. And that's a whole different strategy in com computing. Sir. Um, in this architecture that you've outlined here, do you think that accomplishing this is a requires a regulatory approach or could be accomplished through a market approach that's like an industry consortium or something along those lines? Um, I prefer the latter. Um, I believe that uh, a, a, a central approach uh, that does not have the buy-in of the manufacturers um, will fail. You know, Ed Schweitzer needs to believe that he no longer needs to collect data and start building machines that don't have data collection in them. Um, I believe it should be done of a consortium of the bright and the willing. That's my question over here. Uh, my question, how you mentioned like the fractal architecture, in particular, it seems like so many different stakeholders, you need like LG and kitchen appliance makers together with utility execs and ISOs, so just how you bring all this okay. together. Let me tell you, and I think that problem is, I th you, you articulated one that I've wrestled with for a long time. But I believe that a grid, and I'm, what's a grid? Oh, God, all right, forget that, okay. Uh, what's a grid? That's the national grid. That's a regional grid, you know, it's a feeder. That's a neighborhood, okay. That's a building, supermarket a grid, is an office building a grid, is an apartment a grid. The truth of the matter is, is that a grid to me is just a ring. And within it there are assets, generation, transmission, distribution, storage, load. So that every control area looks out and says, what can I talk to? And it manages that collection of assets. So to me, the common thing is the ISO manages switches, generation assets, transmission, distribution. Even down at a house, I could have the same paradigm. I think you have to start with that level of abstraction. What assets do I have? What can I do with them? Tough, definitely tough. Okay, so let's make this is the last question. I want to get one final question. Go ahead. Okay, so how do you um, see this, this fractal paradigm working with an increased integration of natural gas assets, gen sets, emergency generators, where the gas system is not necessarily operated by central ISOs that gather this type of outage data. So I don't know how you see the interplay working between those two utility groups. Okay. Um, love the question. 
Uh, I would also throw in wind as a challenge, mm -hmm. okay, in particular. Um, PV not so much, but wind is, is definitely problematic. Um, again, I define grid by the area under control, not by the physical assets. And to me, availability of gas is just one more parameter in the local control decision. Um, my, you know, and it's what do I have to work with now? Now I have a gas supply that lets me spin this turbine or run this Thirling engine. If I don't have that, then it's not part of my asset set and doesn't figure into my local control issue. By the way, the ISOs are going to be the last ones to fall. They, they, they get paid a lot. They have the biggest toys. I think it's going to be a long time, but I intend to sneak up on them from the house up. <laughs> and, so, and Terry Boston, who ran PJM, is one of my very good friends. And we've gone through this same discussion a fair number of times. So. And so my last question is, in my class, we've been discussing the concept of a hemispheric grid, as proposed by Hillary Clinton, um, where it includes uh, Canada, US, and Mexico. What do you think? We have it. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, power flows across the border. You know, Hydro-Quebec is an important generating asset for the United States. Uh, I am less concerned with grids of titanic scale than grids of local scale. I'm, I, my interests and passion are moving in the other direction. Titanic scale was only necessary before we had advanced control technology. And what about Mexico? It would be over. We currently have a relationship with Mexico. We do. We move power. Um, California, because of its strict environmental regulations, loves to generate with less control in Mexico. U.S. doesn't provide much power to Mexico, but Mexico provides power to the U.S. on a routine basis. The Texas-Mexican border is um, less developed than the San Diego, the California-Mexico border, so not much power flows there, and, and the Texas grid operates autonomously anyway. But, uh, you know, more integration is good, as long as we don't go back to thinking of just titanic central systems. Well, let's thank our speaker for thank a you. very Thanks, everybody.